afternoon, everyone. Are you ready for some compensation? <laughs> yes, always, always. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, we're going to start out by just talking about some principles, and then we're going to move into some more details around compensation. Next slide. So I think you may have seen this slide before um, in our previous Elevate session and in other perhaps compensation presentations, but we really try um, to live by our compensation principles. And we have some principles that are foundational. Uh, it's important to remember that we have total compensation, which includes your base salary, as well as leave, retirement, and benefits. So really at the university, it's a whole total compensation uh, principle. And we have to keep that in mind when we're making offers to candidates as well, right? Let's be on a base pay. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that salary is very personal to people. And we need to make sure that we're treating people equitably. Um, we need to be sure that morale is high and we can attract and retain our quality staff members. We want to make sure our reputation is for fair and competitive pay. And to be honest, we believe the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act in Colorado has really pushed us in that direction, I think. Um, so we are better aligned with people's experience and the pay that they receive. We also look at internal equity. And I think many of you know when we're doing salaries, um, we're using our model to figure out where somebody would be placed on the range, but we also need to look at our internal equity so that any hires or promotions um, are equitable compared to the other people within the school. And sometimes if jobs are very, very specific, we'll get down to the department level, but we really need to look across the whole school of medicine. Um, being fair, and eliminating any kinds of biases when we look at wages really helps reduce our risk and any liability to the university. And that's part of our jobs, right? To eliminate risk and reduce liability for the university. Um, and by being fair and inclusive, our work environment is able to attract and retain that diverse, diverse talent that we need. Next slide. So when we look at salary setting, um, these are some of the best practices we use. Um, we look at the candidate's qualifications, that's their relevant experience internally, as well as externally, um, and, and any education they have. As I mentioned, internal equity across the school. Uh, we also look across campus, because sometimes we're competing with, with other colleges on our campus. Um, budget, of course, is a consideration for the department, total comp package. Um, and many times, <laughs> if we find, I guess, a pregnant example, um, we have a small group of clinical pharmacists um, within our pediatrics department, which is very specialized and unique skill set. And so we need to look at what the market is paying for those jobs and be sure we're being competitive in that specialized area. With best practices, uh, we really have to have our new hire and our promotional salaries within the salary range. Um, we don't want people falling below the minimum of the range, and we don't want people being paid above the maximum of the range. The range is being set so that individuals know where they may fall within that structure. If somebody is in their early stages of their career, typically they're going to be paid near the minimum of the range. So within the School of Medicine, if I meet the minimum qualifications for a job, I will be paid at or near the minimum of that range. Um, folks that are being voluntarily or involuntarily promoted or reclassified potentially have a lower salary than the current salary they have. Because again, we have to look at equity now within that job group and that job level versus the one they came from. An employee's making a lateral move, say from pediatrics 
to geriatrics. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> they would be a, it would be a lateral move in terms of their position and their pay because we don't want to have internal competition between the departments. We want to function in the whole school. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, we talk about total compensation. So it's really not all about money, although I would think maybe some folks think that, but it also includes what is the culture we're creating? How do we share our values? How do we nurture and grow and develop our employees? What kind of communications do we have? Can we be clear with those communications? How about recognition and appreciation? Sometimes a, a heartfelt thank you goes a very long way. And of course, work-life balance. We have great time off benefits that are up for people to use. And we also have great other benefits like tuition assistance and those types of things. Next slide. So um, any questions before I talk about faculty salary setting about our general compensation principles? I don't think so. Okay, thank you. All right, so faculty salary setting occurs at the department level, right? It doesn't occur at the school level because there are so many different disciplines and, and data drives such different pay across those different disciplines. So market data that we consider for faculty salary setting is part of the AANC benchmark. We use public data national there are other salary surveys that can supplement the AANC data. And we use the fixed compensation. Some organizations have variable comp, some don't. So we want to use the fixed compensation. Also, when looking at this data, you want to consider the qualifications. And in many departments across the School of Medicine, that's time and rank how long somebody's been in their rank as a professor, for example, is going to drive pay. You also need to evaluate for your internal equity and you don't want to create any salary inequities when you hire new people on or promote. So you have to keep a very keen eye on what that internal equity looks like for your faculty at the various faculty levels. Next slide. Cool. We do have a quick question that came up. Um, it's from Betsy. She says, what happens when someone is passed up year after year for a raise due to budget restrictions? And that's a that's a staff question. So we'll wait until we're going to hold that till we get to the staff section. Okay. Okay. We'll make sure we do that. <laughs> Sweet. So if you could answer in the chat, uh, yes, no, some thinking about it. Does your department have salary ranges and or a compensation plan for your faculty positions? We'll just take a minute for you to answer. I don't see lots of yeses. So, Brendan, overall, are you seeing mostly yeses? Yeah, it looks like we have mostly yeses, and they're seeing only one no as of for now. Okay. Okay, that's great. That's great to hear. Awesome. So thank you, everybody. So now we'll go ahead and hop over into more um, items about faculty salary setting. Um, so when we're evaluating faculty salaries, there are a number of factors that we want to consider. The first one is like faculty. Some examples, if it's all MDs or all PhDs, um, we, those can be compared to each other in terms of experience or in time of rank. And then we wanna compare them to salary benchmarks that Lori had just mentioned. Um, some of the default benchmarks are the AAMC data. 
And then there's other societal benchmarks that may be supplemented as appropriate. Usually when we see more education and more experience, that may garner a higher placement against the benchmarks. And then plotting out salaries versus experience and then layering in the benchmark data will give you a better idea of where there might be some imbalances. So that's why it's always good to have um, some faculty salary um, compensation plans so you can make sure as you bring people in, you're following that correct plan. Um, so for our next slide, we do have a graph that kind of helps show them. So this is a um, graph from the Power BI AAMC report. So if we're looking at the blue line here, um, we can see that the male with about two years of experience is making less than the male with about six years. And then same with the green line, that's the, looks like it's female. So the female with three years of experience is making less than a female with about eight years of experience. So this is a good way to start to see if maybe there are some inequities. Let's say someone was brought in with two years of experience and they're a lot higher than somewhere someone with six. This is kind of a good starting point to see where there might be some issues. Some other factors that are good to consider for faculty are market conditions. So that is who's your competition and what are they paying? Um, another factor is historical performance. So let's say you have two faculty with similar experience, but the pay is significantly different. Um, you'll kind of want to see is there a difference in their job performance as to why that pay might be different. You also want to make sure you're paying attention to gender, race, and ethnicity equity. Um, so for example, do similar, similarly situated males and females make about the same um, or same with like is someone that's white and someone that's uh, POC making that are similarly situated making the same amount as well. And then another factor to consider is compression. Um, so for that one, an example is, are you hiring new people in at higher rates than existing faculty? Or do you have two small differences between faculty um, with significantly different experience and performance? So that's just, those are some other items to consider when you're um, looking at faculty salary. So I think that's our last slide for faculty. Are there any questions regarding them? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Sweet. And then also, if it's easier to come off the mute and ask too, we're totally okay with that as well. So, next, let's see. There we go. So, now we're going to hop into university staff salary setting. Um, so, for university staff compensation, Central HR sets salary ranges for positions based on external market data. And then SOMHR, um, we also help set salary ranges for some research services position and then those, um, some positions in community practice. So for the research services, that's our clinical lab um, information sciences. Um, the ranges are reviewed annually and adjusted as needed. Um, the last time we had a salary range adjustment was in July of 2023. And then with these ranges, the posting hiring range is typically um, the minimum to the 40th percentile of the range. If you do want to go higher than that, please reach out to um, Central HR and SOMHR so we can get that approved if you want to post past that 40th percentile of the range. Um, so next, we just kind of want to talk about how we help determine salary ranges for staff. So there's three separate categories that we use when we are um, going into making it. The first is job family. So we have academic services, business services um, going on down. And then within each job family, we have sub functions. So for example, for research services, we have clinical sciences, information, et cetera. So once we get our job family and our sub function, we then also look at the level. So that's on this next slide. So we have entry to director. So then taking those three categories um, into consideration is how we help create our salary range. So for an example, if you're an academic services job family, your sub function is in faculty affairs and you're at the senior professional level, you'll be within a certain salary range based off of that group. Um, this next part is just an overview of recent staff compensation initiatives we've gone through. So in December of 21 was phase one of our research personnel initiative. Then in April, we had phase two and three. And then we also had a market analysis and update of the salary staff ranges. In July of 2022, we had our fiscal year 23 annual compensation process. So that's our axiom upload um, table one that happens every fiscal year. Um, then in fall of 22, going into January of 2023, 
we had our collection and review of staff resumes, and then that led to our compression initiative. Then in July of 2023, we had our fiscal year 24 annual compensation process, and then also the market another market analysis and update of staff salary ranges. And then this past September, we had another compression initiative, and then pending Board of Regents approval, this coming July, we'll have our um, fiscal year 25 annual compensation process. Let's see. So our next slide. Um, and then these are just some updates that will be coming. So we are anticipating range updates for the following groups. So our lab sciences, clinical sciences, information sciences, ambulatory care nursing, MAs, patient care techs, LPNs, um, certified athletic trainers. Um, so this whole group, we are anticipating that their ranges will be updated for fiscal year 25. So then that leads into our next slide, our university staff salary ranges. So new ranges will start July 1st, um, 2024. Please note that not all ranges will be adjusted. Um, employees um, below the new ranges must at least be brought to that minimum of the new range. And then uh, campus HR should be providing fiscal year 25 ranges by mid-March. So then that way um, they can assist departments with their axiom process. So if we do know someone's falling below that minimum, um, we can use the axiom process to help get them back above it, um, et cetera. Next is some guidance from SOMHR compensation. So prior to looking at your merit, we do recommend that you first look um, to bring everyone to the new fiscal year 25 range minimum. So that's just meaning if you see someone and they're falling below the minimum, they need to be brought at least up to that new minimum amount. Next, you want to look at what you need to do to keep people in place and keep people in the same place in the new scale. A good way to um, figure that out is doing a comp ratio. So what comp ratio is, is we take the individual, the individual um, employee's pay rate, and then we want to divide their, um, their salary by the midpoint of the salary range. And so if you're at a 1.0 comp ratio, it means they are paid at the midpoint and then anything that's lower or higher of value then that 1.0 will indicate if they're um, where they're paid relevant to the midpoint of the range. We do have an example coming up, so we can explain that more as we get into that example. Um, so now do you review that piece? You'll then want to review their TQS score for those in the like job family, um, subfunction and position level to help stay equitably balanced, and then look at what a merit increase looks like um, within that structure. So let's go ahead and hop into some examples. So first we have Sally. Sally is a research services clinical sciences professional. Her current TQS is at 7.25. Her salary is at 53,600. So the current range for this group is the minimum 51, 239. The midpoint is 68,660. And the max is 8681. So her current comp ratio is 0.78. So we got that by taking her current salary, dividing it by our midpoint, and she's at 0.78. So going with the guidance we just went over, the first thing we want to look at is, is she above the fiscal year 25 um, range minimum? The answer is yes. Um, here's what that new range will look like. So the minimum is 51,956. Her current salary is above that. Next thing we want to look at is um, what is needed to keep her in the same place um, on the new scale. So for that, we'll take that 0.78 combo ratio we just got, and we want to multiply that by the new mid. Uh, midpoint. So we do the 0.78 times 69, 621. And so this is saying that um, in order to keep her where she's currently at um, on the new range scale, her new salary would be need to be 54,304. And then after we look at that, we want to look at um, internal equity. So what does internal equity look like for those with a similar um, TQS score as her and in the same um, job family and function? So in looking at that, we look at those with similar TQS between seven and 7.5, and their average salary is 54,296. And her salary is currently 53,600. So she's within um, a good range of that. And then lastly, we're gonna wanna what, look at what merit looks like. So based on her performance rating, we're gonna apply a merit of 3% because that's typically what the pool would be. So then that would make her new salary 55,208, and it still falls within um, a good equitable standpoint for her. Are there, we have another example. Are there any questions before we move on to that next example? Mm 
<laughs> Looks like we have one. About, yeah, there's a question about TQS. Yes, and I think, do we touch on that soon, Lori, on how to calculate TQS? Or should I give a quick, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, Brendan. Okay, so yeah, so a TQS score is calculated um, by a certain, for like some different amounts, uh, different factors. So first we look at um, if they have a degree. So if you have a bachelor's degree, you get four points, master's six, and if you have your PhD, it goes up to eight. Um, we do have a guide on this in our internet site as well. We can link that here, so that way you can have that guidance also. And then we look at relevant experience. So then for every year of relevant experience, you also get an additional TQS point. And so based off of what your degree is and how many relevant years of experience is what your TQS score is. Does that help explain, Nelia? Yes, okay, cool. So let's go into our next example. So now we have Sarah and she's a lab services manager. Um, so her TQS is 24 and her salary is at 100,000. So the range for the research services lab manager, um, so it starts at 61,894, 61, goes up to 103,981. If we look at her midpoint, um, to get her combo ratio, we'll divide the 100 by the 82,938. So her current combo ratio is 1.21. So then following the same questions we just followed for Sally, first, is she above the fiscal year 25 range minimum? Yes, she is, she's well above them. Next is what is needed to keep her in, in the same place on the new scale. So by taking the same logic, taking her combo ratio and multiplying that by the new midpoint, it's saying her new range salary should be about 107,298. And then next you wanna look at internal equity um, with similar or same with the people in the same similar TQS. So this one, since she's a manager, the average is a little bit wider just because we don't have as many lab managers um, as we would a uh, clinical sciences professional. And that's saying that um, average current pay for that is 87,536. So then from there, when we look at merit, um, clearly Sarah's salary is a lot higher than what the current average is. So we would say based on her performance rating, we would still wanna award merit, but you'd wanna kind of keep that um, at a minimal percentage just because since she is so high above the um, others already, increasing your salary even more will kind of throw off equity within that group. Are there any questions? Look, we have one from Amanda. Where would we get the information to answer questions two through four? So yeah, so I think Lori and I could probably help with that piece, Amanda, um, for each specific role. Yeah, so I think um, Lori and I could probably help with that part, right, Lori, since she's CP, or would they go to their regional directors first? salary ranges are are given and you would be able to figure out um, what the new salary salary would be on the new scale using the comp ratio um, yeah for these stuff the scales are posted I'll we'll put that in the chat where the scales are and in terms of internal equity yes Brent and I can help you with that in terms of looking at overall school wide using the, the position levels of function job family, but you can also look at internal equity to be more you, you can see that information or work with your DFA. And then in terms of what merit looks like, I, I'm a firm believer that performance should, and merit should correlate. Um, Every department would set that a little bit differently, but you know your highest performers might get the highest merit, but if they're already highly compensated, maybe they don't get as much. A lot of times people will look at where is somebody's pay between in the range, and those who have, say, a rating of five but are lower in the range might get a greater increase than those that get a five that are higher in the range. Right? Because we're saying the midpoint of our range is the median of our market. And that's where we really want people to cluster. Great. We'll now hop over to our compensation model. Right. So we'll go back to Lori. <laughs> so uh, 
we developed a model a few years ago when we looked at compression for the first time so that we could follow the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act. So we had a consistent way of placing people on the range based on their total qualification score, um, which Brendan mentioned is your education, your external relevant experience, and your internal relevant experience. Um, since we implemented the compensation, there is a better correlation between our TQS and where you're placed on the salary range. It's a mathematical formula. I'll touch on some of those high points in a minute. Um, we also use um, a total qualification worksheet when we're reviewing an individual's resume. Um, we actually have a worksheet that it's an Excel document which does all the calculations for us when we're putting in um, months and years, somebody's worked in a job. And we've also included the guidance about how we go about calculating this. Um, when we apply the model, um, using an individual's TQS, we, get, we attain the model gives us a predicted salary. And then we review internal equity as we've discussed across the school and then we present you with a salary range that's approved that reflects the individual's TQS and our internal equity. So it's a combination of both of those factors. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, if an individual meets the minimum qualifications for a position, they are pay, paid at or near the minimum of the salary range. And I think a lot of you have seen that, especially with our entry folks and research services. If they're just coming out of school with a degree and their experience, you almost are all 100% spot on with what your salary is up to. And how the model works is that for every one year above the minimum qualification, individuals get 2.9, 412 percentiles of pay which moves them along the, the pay range. So a percentile of pay is different than a percentage of pay. So a percentile of pay is a flat dollar amount that's determined by taking the maximum of the salary range minus the minimum and dividing that result by 100. Uh, percentiles do vary um, based on what the range numbers are. And typically, you can see it varies based on the level of position as well. And also, it's called the range spread. So in this picture, um, we're showing one TQS is equal to one year of relevant experience. And if an individual has a TQS of zero, you see they're paid near the range minimum. 8.5 around the 25th percentile of the range, 17 TQS points above the minimum qualifications is paid around the midpoint. 25 and a half, again, above that minimum required around the 75th, and 34 TQS points will get somebody to the maximum. So if I'm an entry-level professional with a TQS score of 38, my salary is going to be at the maximum of the range of what our model will predict. Any questions about that? Okay, next slide. So a couple of examples. And these examples are put together to help, to help you think about where people are placed on the range. It's not about the dollars, but really about the placement because all of the ranges are different. Okay? So in this first example, we have a senior research services professional in clinical sciences. Um, the minimum qualifications for that level is a bachelor's in two years or a TQS of six. John has a master's in 10 years of experience. So John's TQS is 16. So John has 10 years above the minimum. So his salary would be around the 30th percentile of the range. It'd be those 10 years above the minimum qualifications 
times the 2.9412 factor puts them at 29.41 percentile of the range. We also have another John who's a certified medical assistant. That position requires high school or GED plus one year of experience, so a TQS of one. This John also has a master's in 10 years, so 16. So John has 15 years above the minimum for a certified medical assistant. So his salary would be around the 45th percentile of the range. Again, those 15 years above the minimum qualifications times the 2.9412 factor puts them at 44.11 percentile of the range. So if we go to the next slide, all right, we're all on track now with how people are placed on the range. So what does that mean in terms of pay? So in our first example, our salary range is 55,000 to 55,393 to 93,061. We find the percentile rate, which is 376.68. At the 30th percentile of the range, that would be a pay of 66,693. So we would take the percentile rate multiply that by the 2.9412 times the additional 10 years of experience above the minimum and add that value to the minimum of the range. Right? In our second example, again, we have a salary range of 4368 to 54089. And you can see the percentile rate in this case is $104. And to get to the 45th percentile of the range would be 48,369. And if you look at the midpoint of the range, which is 48,880, you can see that the 45th was approaching the 50th. So that number should be pretty close. Looks like we have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, does the TQS always go from 1 to 34 for a salary range? Yes. Okay. And then how do you get the percentile rate again? You take the maximum of the range. So like in the first example here, 93061, and you subtract 55,393 from that. So you get about 58,000. And odds a little high, 48,000, 38,000. You get that number, 38,000, and you divide it by 100. So you get the 37668 for the percentile rate. Forgot the divide by 100. Thanks, Lori. <laughs> I think those are all the questions. Okay. So let's move on. So one of the things I mentioned earlier um, is the TQS worksheet. And first off, I want to give a huge shout out to Kim Ball, Stephanie Maybe, Kayla Ross, and Ashley Scarborough, who were part of my first pilot group with this process. The purpose was to see if we could have our HR business partners complete our worksheets and then submit them with their salary request. Um, this initial pilot group was chosen because of the vast number of salary requests that were coming in at the time. After we finished the pilot, and they continued to provide us with worksheets with the, their new salary requests, you can see some of the comments were made. Um, and it, actually was what I had hypothesized. So that was very exciting. So definitely worth their time to complete the worksheet. Helps them to understand the candidate's background better. Helps, helps with questions. And also they're able to speak 
better to their managers regarding the salary decision because this information they haven't had. And then they also get to keep the information for any future promotions or things like that. Easily, you can easily update the worksheet, resubmit it with the natural progression from the Next slide. So a couple asks also came from this pilot. Um, one, it's around, is there some kind of calculator of a department we can have so we know we have a better idea of what salary of people is going to look like? Mm -hmm. HRBPs in the pilot group mentioned this because it helps them to better manage their managers and PIs' expectations around what salary might look like. And then to add clear instructions to the worksheet. Um, you know, we want the most recent job on first. And we want the degree dates. So do you leave blank so the worksheet doesn't, you know, inaccurately calculate something we don't want to calculate? So we took a look at this in our next steps. Um, and I think this will be helpful for all of us is to develop a matrix of TQS and placement on the range, which will look similar to the chart we showed earlier. Uh, make sure we have clear instructions for the worksheet and incorporate a calculator into the TQS worksheet that will produce an offer for us, which would have like the minimum amount, the minimum dollar amount to offer that's still equitable within the school, what the model suggests, and what is the maximum we can offer that still keeps us in an equitable fashion. Um, Having a structure like this can really help in terms of perhaps you have to do some negotiation with a candidate, right? Maybe you start at the model suggestion, they need a little bit more. You still have that approval for a little bit more. And then we're going to add some additional departments to the pilot to test this new process. Any questions about our TQS worksheet pilot or our next steps? seeing anything in the chat. Thank you. Next slide. Alternate funded. Okay, so this is me. Um, so this next slide is just talking about alternate funded and classified staff. Um, so basically what this is just telling us is for our alternate funded and classified staff positions, we utilize the state of Colorado salary ranges for our salary ranges. Um, there are a few instances where um, maybe where we are seeing that our jobs aren't exactly mirroring the state jobs as well. So then we'll create our own salary ranges. But for the most part, for this group, we do uh, mirror what the state of Colorado does for those ranges. Um, any questions on that? Mm -hmm. Cool. So now I'll hop into the July 1 labor planning process. So this first part is just kind of what the salary increases are for. So um, the first part is the regents have to approve a pool annually um, for it to take um, effect. Um, staff are only eligible for a July 1 uh, merit increase. And then faculty are eligible for both a July 1 um, merit increase or also a January 1 mid-year table increase. Um, so these increases do address merit, equity, uh, market, or compression really any type of increase, we try to use the salary um, setting um, process to help address these uh, items. And then in order to be eligible for the increases, they have to be hired or promoted by 2-1 of that fiscal or that year to be eligible for the July 1 rates. Um, so a note on merit increases. So merit is not a cost of living adjustment and that is not part of this process. Um, for performance review scores, you do want to consider the performance, performance review score as the primary factor when determining merit increases. So, for example, someone who received a score of a five for outstanding should receive a larger increase than someone who received a score of three for meeting expectations. Um, every year there is a justification threshold. So depending on what the pool is, so let's say if it's 3.8 percent, we do ask um, and SOM Finance will ask for a justification if the um, increase that's being rewarded is double that. So this year, if the increase is greater than or equal to 7.6%, then 
then there'll be a justification needed for why you want to offer um, that high of an increase. Um, also, those not eligible for a merit increase are those higher are promoted after two, February 1st of 2024 and those who got a review score of below meeting expectations. So if they received a one or a two, they're not eligible for merit increases. And then just a couple more things on merit. You do wanna make sure you're reviewing positions for internal parity before distributing that merit pool. Um, so that's just saying that people in similarly situated um, employees should have similar salaries. So unless there are significant differences in performance, it is important to maintain internal equity in order to avoid discrimination or equal pay claims. Um, and it's especially important for individuals and in protected classes. It's also important um, that in addition to looking at that, that you also, in addition to performance, you also want to take into consideration employees that are in hard to fill roles and employees that have highly unique and hard to recruit skill sets. And then lastly, um, for university staff, you want to make sure you review the people whose salaries are already over the maximum of the range as well. So that concludes our portion. Are there any questions before we pass it over to Don? Oh, it looks like Lynette has her hand raised. Brendan, it may not be um, a question that you could answer, but I mm -hmm. just wonder if anyone else has, I guess, thoughts on the conversation when the merit pool is emailed to everyone. So everyone is thinking, oh, I'm going to get a 3% increase, but that merit should be based on the review score. Does that make sense that that's a tough conversation? And I'm looking yeah. for some guidance on that because yeah. it's it's out there in the email. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do we want to add anything now or... <laughs> So, I mean, the, bar, the pool is, is, yeah, the pool is advertised. Um, I think that's up to the departments on how they're going to spend it. Um, we don't, you know, we don't tell you, you know, to spend your entire pool or how to spend it. We provide, obviously provide guidelines. Um, I think that there, I think, you know, people understand that if you get a higher review score, you should probably get a higher raise. I think merit is a pretty, um, easy to understand concept, but um, I think you just, I, I think if you have some sort of standard in your department, it's also, that's also helpful for, um, you know, or some sort of formula. So if you get a three, you get on your review, you get this percentage of a raise. If you get, you know, a four, you get this percentage of a raise. I think if you have something like that, that's, that's a little bit more standardized, then it makes that easier to explain to people. Hey, Lynette, this is Dan Page. A great question, and thanks, Deanna and Brendan. So, Lynette, um, I've been wondering that same thing from last year. Do the DAs or the division administrators get that um, that guidance versus just giving it, giving everybody? Oh, the pool is for, and whether you get in what Deanna was saying, right? So, does that make sense? I'm asking if you and Jimmy give guidance to the division administrators. That's a that's a, a, a we'll have a one off with that one, Dan, from the Department of Medicine. We'll we'll chat with Jimmy and Tate. Really manage the pool here, and basically the division administrators are given the amount within the DOM. They're given their pool, and I guess my they are given the pool. And I guess my question, like Deanna addressed, was that it was advertised. And that's, it's just a tough conversation because it is advertised, but what Deanna shared as guidance is extremely helpful. So we set the expectation um, up front and that's something that we could do better with. So, yeah. 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 Um, I don't, I hope it's okay if I jump in, Deanna and, and Brendan, this is Lindsay in um, orthopedics. So Lynette, obviously we're in school of medicine, not um, DOM, but what we've done, um, our DFA has done similar to what Deanna is talking about is putting kind of a, a quartile or a matrix together based on those scores. So if someone says, hey, I heard the pool is 4%, that means everyone's getting a 4%, right? We really kind of curate the message to say that 4% is probably where um, most folks who are kind of in the middle of those scores, you know, like a three score, 
are going to fall more into that pool. It's not guaranteed, but we say, you know, obviously it's based on performance scores. Um, because obviously if you're going to have to have a hard conversation with someone who maybe didn't get a three, you know, or, or, or didn't get a great score, um, but they are still eligible for um, an increase, then, you know, you know that you have kind of that in place to say, you know, we've, we've set this or put this matrix in place. Sorry, it kind of went on a tangent, but that's what we've done in our department. And it really helps to manage that conversation. Okay, yes, that's helpful. Thank you. I just, awesome. Betsy in the renal division, I just wanted to circle back to my question I put in chat about if a PI says I don't, I can't give someone a raise, I don't have the budget, you know, we don't have the grant funding. Um, I just didn't think that was an excuse with the equal pay for equal work. I mean, it puts that person lower than everyone else. Um, so I didn't know if that's, if that flies or not. Um, for that piece, Lori, are you able to help pop in on that one? I'm not. I can jump in. Sure. Or booming somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Betsy. Hi, everybody. Um, so I think some of it is like peer pressure that will, um, I say peer pressure, but in a way, right? So the minimums that we have to do are the minimum, the minimum that the salary ranges. So regardless, we have to bring somebody up to the minimum of the salary ranges. But there is discretion on merit increases and those salary increases. And whether we want to acknowledge it or not, sometimes budget is a part of that discussion. However, we know that retention and recruitment is difficult and we have a lot of competition. And so what will happen, what we see happen a lot of times with um, some labs that may not have the same type of funding or maybe that have that mentality to say that, you know, I can't give this level of increases whether it's true or not, um, we see some of those labs getting picked off or some of those areas. It's not just even in the lab areas. We can see, um, you know, some administrative areas where the same things. And so there's pressure one way or the other. Are you going to provide those um, potential increases so that your salary stay competitive in your area or are you potentially going to lose um, high performing employees because they can go other places in the university um, and maybe get a higher salary. So there is some pressure for that when you think about the recruitment and retention pieces and being able to keep good employees, there, there's some incentive there, but we can't totally um, discredit budget. It is a reality. We do have to be able to afford people, but trying to find a good balance between the two would be my recommendation. And as a business partner, just trying to give them that recommendation of, you know, some of those talking points that we've talked about in the past about how expensive it is to um, train and recruit new, new people and the return and investment on retaining high performing employees and those kind of things would be my recommendation on like giving guidance to PIs that you may hear that kind of information from. Thank you. Of course. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Or we have over. If not, I will stop talking and pass it over to Dawn. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brennan. Next slide, please. All right. So I'm going to go through some of the areas for the labor planning process logistics. And first off, there are three different categories, main categories for your reasons for increase. So you have your merit, your market, and equity, which are all part of the merit pool under um for something that has been happening for the last mm, over a decade. This, these are the same categories that you've already always had. Um, <clears throat> please, again, spending authority within your means. I think Wumi touched off on that and explained it rather well. There is a balance there. Uh, stipend adjustments. This is kind of different because there's been some changes with stipends. Um, previously, when we had more stipends on like your main faculty, regular faculty position, now going through a couple processes, um, Deanna has worked really hard in September trying to move some of those off for certain positions uh, or titles over to their individual positions. Um, these will not be captured for um, any changes in Axiom at this point. Uh, what we're really concentrating on are truly those merit increases or through the merit pool. If there are increases um, or changes with stipends, 
that are on your regular faculty positions, you'll wanna make sure to capture those because of the salary upload, because we wanna make sure their compensation is correct when um, July 1 comes around. So if there are any changes, deletions, um, removals of stipends, uh, please go through uh, the FRF process, which is a smart sheet through faculty affairs. We're also asking for you to include the title, the administrative titles for any of those stipends. So down in the comments box on uh, Axiom, you will have the opportunity to kind of provide that. We don't have in the system as of yet an HCM where we can really see those titles. So for right now, we're asking for through this process so we can kind of keep track of those for when we get to that space. Um, the other thing is FTE changes. So this is important for you guys have FTE changes throughout the entire process. Some people change month every month, some are just once a year. Um, we're asking that you include a note in the comment section, just letting us know that yes, this is what the FTE was and we're changing it to this FTE on X date. This will help us just to confirm that we have the correct information, which impacts your compensation. Any new hires, promotions, transfers, again, I know we're, we've all said it, um, after February 1 are not eligible for increases. All right, next slide, please. So staff natural progression or any kind of promotions must be submitted by April 15th. This will help allow us to get um, everything in for a 5-1 start. Otherwise, we'll need to hold on to those and really look at an 8-1 effective date. For faculty natural progression from like an instructor to a senior instructor, we can recognize that in Axiom, but you'll also have to go through the FRF process or a new letter of offer um, and have that go through. If it's before 7-1, uh, then we'll want to make sure that it's included in there on Axiom if they're eligible for an increase. So if they received a promotion but didn't receive an increase at that time, you can update it in Axiom and be able to provide an increase at that time. Um, if not, everything after will have to go in after the salary upload. So faculty promotions, assistant, associate, and professor increases should all be recognized in using the merit category in Axiom as in previous years. So we want to identify those who are receiving a promotion. For these ones, we will be adding information into Axiom that says they've gone through that um, process of that committee of the promotions. We'll include what the current uh, title is, and then we'll update it and put the information in there for their new rank. So there will be that information in there, as well as you guys will have all the information in your smart sheets of who has gone up for promotion. Next slide, please. Justifications. This is my ultimate favorite section of the entire labor planning salary setting process. I'm joking. Um, so one of the things with this one, it's a little bit different this year because we have a three, we've, they've, um, asked for a 3.8% increase. It's the 7.6, so it's not um, what we're used to seeing. One helpful thing there with justifications, if you're in Axiom, the system is going to warn you if your increase is 7.6% or higher, So and it will not allow you to save. So it's kind of nice, it'll trigger and let you know, hey, you need a new justification um, in order to move forward. Um, the other thing, too, is to remember is any faculty receiving an equity uh, increase will need a justification. So equity increases are um, outside of that normal 7.6, but we'll need justifications for those. Okay, when it comes to justifications, the, the reason needs to be meaningful. Um, know your audience. There are several different positions to say, John's reviewing, Brian Smith, it goes to the dean. We are in the process of searching for a new dean. So we're gonna have a new dean come in and not necessarily be uh, have all the information and we'll be reviewing these or scrutinizing things a little bit differently possibly from what has been historically happened. Then it goes all the way up to the chancellor's office. 
Um, so please be mindful of when you're writing these to use complete sentences, make it so we can understand. We don't know these faculty or staff like you do, and we really want people to have those increases. So please um, do your due diligence and include those justifications so we understand why they should be receiving those um, and understanding a clear picture. Next slide, please. Okay. So we've had starter sentences in the past. Um, this is a good start. That doesn't mean that these are the only sentences that you would include in just filling in a few things. We really want that detail when um, you're providing those justifications. I know there's a lot of benchmarks out there. Please identify those. Um, the other thing too is if you're comparing positions, please include specifics. This will help us with, we have the, equity pieces, and we do need to do some comparisons to make sure that we're staying equitable. So as much information as you can put in there so we can have a complete understanding of the reason for the justification or the increase. Um, let's see here, new scales. Oh, if you have new scales within your department or some structural changes, please let us know or please send us those um, reports so we can actually kind of look at those and refer back to them if somebody has questions when we're going through our review process if you're identifying those in your justifications that would be a huge help so any structural changes um, or compensation plans please send those ahead of time that would be helpful or if not please submit those no later than the 26th of april when everything is due um the other thing to remember um, because we have a new DA coming in, uh, there's going to be some new questions. So bear with us to start thinking of somebody new coming in, what would they be looking at? Um, there are typically, if there's variations and stuff, um, we will go through and sort by percentages. So if you have really large increases, those are ones we definitely get more, they get looked at more um, thoroughly and um, want to make sure there's information going on there. Um, copy and pasting your justification across the board does not work and it doesn't show that um, it's something specific to that individual. Um, so we'll, unless it's a structural change across. So just please be mindful of justifications when you're submitting those. All right, next slide, please. Okay. Um, if you need help throughout this process, you have definitely some resources for you. Uh, salary setting information, and of course, school and HR, um, any of the budget or actual logistics or mechanics with um, getting your increases in, you'll want to ask those from SOM Finance. Uh, the other thing is if you have functionality questions, Axiom is not working for you, or if there's something quirky or you have questions, there's the Axiom team at you know, Shoots that can help you out. There's also resources on our intranet that have guides, um, FAQs. Um, you'll have some more information there. So it's a good uh, resource for it there too. That was pretty quick and dirty. Um, do you, does anybody have any questions for me that I can help answer in this part of the process? Looks like there's one in the chat. Um, okay. To verify faculty natural progression from instructor to senior instructor with no increase are allowed from after 2-1 through 615. And we can include this increase in axiom. Is this correct? This is what this was based on what was allowed last year. Um before 2-1? If yes, if there was after. a after. Yes. After 2-1. If there wasn't a increase um provided during that promotion, then they can include it on the axiom. Okay. Thank you. There will be more, at least there will be more some more information going out from not only the Axiom team within the next week, but we and the School of Medicine Finance team will be sending out more information as well as we're getting close to the March 1st data pool um, and then opening up the labor planning on 318. And if so you have any questions, please reach out. And then just a reminder, if you haven't already run your position cleanup report, this would be a good time to do it. 
didn't. Well, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions that we can help you with? All right, we'll get this um, uploaded on the internet and we'll get the slides out. Um, we'll get the slides out sooner than we'll get it uploaded, <laughs> but we'll get the recording uploaded as well. Thanks everybody, have a great week. Thanks, you too. Yeah.